those basic physical needs that, that others may have. It opens the door to minister to the spiritual needs so that a life-changing relationship can begin with Jesus Christ. We have a creative arts time, and usually that's pottery. They'll begin to open up and start sharing things during that time. When you sit there and you have the clay in your hand, you know what you're going to be doing with it and what's going to become of it. But the clay doesn't know what it's going to have to go through to get to it. Sometimes our lives are broken, and we're like just a big old lump of clay. And so lives can be molded and shaped by Jesus to be able to accomplish his perfect will. I have never seen a life change like Yvonne's. And it's just been amazing to watch God work in her life and then see how he's using her now in our ministry. I never would have thought that I would be where I am today because I had no hope. This place saved my life. When you give to Annie Armstrong, you help to make my ministry possible. Jesus never gives up on you, and so we should never give up on anybody else. Good morning, First Baptist. Let's stand. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? All right, I got a few. So glad you're joining us with us online. Welcome into the house. Come on, let's put our hands together. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Sing it out. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Come on, sing it out. Let's your voice. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Shout out in your praise, the joy in the house of the Lord. I got a shirt in this place. We won't be quiet. Shout out in your praise. We sing, we sing to the God who leaves. We sing to the God who sings. Sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. A shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house. beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners now we're running free we are forgiven accepted redeemed by his grace let the house of the lord sing praise come on sing it with me we were the beggars now we're royalty we were the prisoners There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out in your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. I got it surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout in your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Shout out in your praise. 
There's joy in the house of the Lord. I got it surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Shout out in your praise. Uh, this is an offering that's uh, above and beyond the tithe that we take. Uh, our goal is $30,000, and the purpose of this is that every penny of it goes to our North American missionaries on the ground who are getting the gospel out to places in North America. That also includes uh, lots of portions of Canada that um, are without churches. And so a lot of church planning able to happen because of that. So we encourage you to give, and hopefully you watch that uh, video at the very beginning of the service that gives you an, um, a little bit of an insight of what that goes to. Number three is an important one for today. So I want to make sure, can you hear me in the very back? If you can hear me in the back, raise your hand. Yes, all right, I make sure everyone can hear. Tonight we are having a special opportunity for you to come and worship. Tonight we are hosting Chosen People Ministries. It's a ministry out of Israel, and uh, what they will be coming to do tonight is to uh, prepare for us an actual Seder meal, um, um, a true Passover meal that they would observe as Jewish people. And what he's going to do, his name's Ephraim Goldstein, he will be leading tonight, and he, what he'll do is show you how the Passover is connected to Christ. And so we invite you to come and participate in that tonight, and then at the end of the service, what we will do is have uh, the Lord's Supper, and we'll share in that together, and we'll have an authentic uh, matzah bread to pass out, not, not what we typically have for Lord's Supper, but we'll have an authentic uh, uh, matzo bread for the Lord's Supper. So come tonight, 6 p.m., and be a part of that. Fourth thing, if you are creative, perk up for just a minute and listen, because we are putting together what we're calling the creative team. And this is going to be a team of people who have some creativity in their background. Maybe you're good with photography or video, or maybe you've got insights and in building some things that we might be able to use on the platform for different sermon series or different events that we have. We just are looking for some really creative people that we can put together as a team to help us even on every Sunday uh, to capture what happens. And so, uh, Brother Janton, our new worship pastor, is going to be uh, your contact for that. So you can see his email address there on the screen if you want to jot that down and just shoot him a message and say, hey, I'm interested in the creative team. He'll know exactly what you're talking about, and he'll be glad to follow up with you. Fifth, but the climax is next Sunday is a big, big day for us. Anybody know what it is? Easter, Resurrection Sunday. We're going to celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate it every Sunday, but it's extra special next Sunday. 9.30 and 11 o'clock services are grow groups, regular schedule, but we want to pack this place out so that we can get the gospel to as many places and people as possible. More people are going to be open to coming to church next Sunday than any other Sunday in the year, so use this as, a, as an opportunity to reach out to them. How many people like surprises? 
Would you like a surprise this morning? Yes? I have a surprise for you. A couple of months ago, Brother Jim Murray got saved. Uh, his name was written on the steps before we put carpet back down, and uh, his daughter had written that on there for him. And um, within a couple of weeks, Brother Jim came to faith in Christ. It was such a glorious day, and uh, we were able to write under his, un, under his name before the carpet went down, saved. And uh, Brother Jim uh, had just some mobility issues that wouldn't allow him to get up to our baptistry, but something amazing happened as a result of that. He has a son that had a son, so his grandson, that got saved. And Brother Jim was able to be baptized at a sister church where his son was able to help and also his grandson got baptized that same day. It was a great Sunday and we wanted to celebrate that with him this morning. And so we have a video of it. So I want you to watch this video and we're gonna celebrate with Jim Murray and his family.
It's okay. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's worthy of that. Come on, church. Amen. Father, we're so grateful for your spirit that's in this house today. And we celebrate your greatness and sing your name. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be It's always been you, Jesus Jesus Sing this with me Jesus be the center of my life Jesus be the center of my life From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus Jesus, there's nothing else matters Nothing in this world your center and everything revolves around you Jesus let's sing this as a church Jesus be the center of your church come on first man just lift your voice and sing it out Jesus be the center of your church
Jesus beat us center It's all about you Yes, it's all about you From my heart to the hills Jesus be the center It's all about you Yes, it's all about you Hold up your voice From my heart to the hands Jesus be the center It's all about you Yes, it's all about you It's in you this morning. It's in Christ that we have our being, our very identity. In all things, Father, we trust you. Father, it says in your word that you tell the lilies of the field to toil and when to spin, and you tell the sparrows and you feed them every morning. And Father, if you do all of that, how much more do you care for us? And so, Father, in response this morning, we simply sing a song of your name, but not just sing a song, but Father, we give of ourselves. And we give us our finances as an act of worship to you. Lord, you said in your word that you would be with us until the end of the world. And that's the promise and the hope that we have this morning. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promise. And we thank you for your blessings upon our lives. And everybody said, Amen.
shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.
Even though I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. These were the words written by the psalmist David who was speaking of an actual valley called the valley of the shadow of death. But the reason why it was called the valley of the shadow of death is because for the believer and for those, as we understand now, are followers of Christ, death is only a shadow. And a shadow is a resemblance of the real, but it's not the real thing. A shadow resembles the shape, but it's not the substance. As I stand here today and I look at the light shining on my hand, making a shadow, the shadow is a resemblance, the shape of my hand, but it's not my hand. My hand, the real thing, and the shadow are different. But the shadow, very carefully listen, the shadow cannot exist without the light. And so for the believer, death is but a shadow. And the reason why there's a shadow is because there is the light. We know the Lord Jesus would say, I am the light of the world. And so Jesus is, in fact, the light. But when we look into the pages of Scripture, what we're able to see is that the Old Testament is the shadow that has been cast by the Lord Jesus in the New Testament. In fact, let me give you a passage of Scripture that might help with that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17 says this, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. So I want to make sure that you're very clear in understanding this morning that the Old Testament is the New Testament enfolded, and the New Testament is the Old Testament unfolded. In other words, the Old Testament is the shadow, the New Testament is the light. What you're looking at in this text of Scripture explains that. Paul is writing to the church of Colossae, and as he's writing to them, there are those who are Jewish in the church, but there's also those who've had Jewish impact on the church, as well as there being Gentiles in the church. And so Paul says to them, there's a little disturbance about what to believe. He said, no one is to judge you in respect to food or drink or respect to a festival. That word festival, what Paul was talking about there is the direct co uh, co connection between <coughs> the Old Testament feast of Israel. There were seven of them, in fact. Seven feasts that the Israelites, the Jewish people, were to observe, and there was purpose behind why they were to observe every single one of them. But Paul is saying to them, these festivals, new moons and Sabbath days, they're only a shadow, but notice what he says, the substance belongs to Christ. Jesus is the light of the New Testament, and the cross is the real thing, but it's casting a shadow into the Old Testament to tell the people of ancient times what to look forward to when Christ does come. I want to preface the rest of the message by saying this. I need to make sure you're awake this morning, and I need to make sure you're paying good attention because this is going to be a deeper sermon. This is not going to be shallow. It's not going to be surface level. We're going to go deep this morning, so I need to know that you're with me. So if you're with me, say yes. yes. All right. Very first time, you've got it. I want you to take your Bible, find the Old Testament book of Leviticus. I know that that's not a book that's read real often, so let me tell you, Genesis, Exodus, and then Leviticus, the third book of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 23. When you find Leviticus 23, you can stand for the reading of God's Word, and as you do that, <clears throat> and as you're finding that, let me tell you that Leviticus is not all that known to people, 
Because while one preacher said, every book of the Bible is equally inspired, but it's not equally as inspiring. And so when you read the book of Acts, wow, there's great things. The Holy Spirit comes, the church is growing. When you read the book of Leviticus, you got to be wide awake because if not, you might just go to sleep. But I want to tell you this, Leviticus 23 is fantastic. And I want to make sure you get it because in all of chapter 23, what we learn is about these seven feasts of Israel. And I want you to begin reading with me in verse 6. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the feast of unleavened bread. It is the unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but for seven days you shall represent an offering and present it by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. Father, when we look into the pages of Leviticus 23, it can be a bit confusing. But Lord, I know that through your Holy Spirit, I can both preach and teach this, and people can understand it because, Lord, this is a shadow cast by the light of your cross. And so, God, I pray, give us understanding, but help us to be excited that the light has come and that darkness could not comprehend it. And so, Lord, let us rejoice in that in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. So, today is called Palm Sunday, and you've been able to see the palms around the church, the palms that were over here uh, on the cross, and uh, the palm leaves were put down on the day that Jesus did his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And the purpose of the palm leaves was that the palm leaf was the, the sign and the symbol of victory. He's a victor. And so they were crying out, Hosanna, come now, Lord, is what they were saying. Come, we want you to come and reign and rule. Have victory over Rome. So in our Christian faith, we celebrate Palm Sunday. But in Palm Sunday, thank you, I, I, I have some allergies living in Kentucky. Anybody with me? Yeah, I mowed one time, one time, and this is what happened. So um, yes, so we're celebrating Palm Sunday. And as we're celebrating Palm Sunday, we're celebrating what begins to be the last week of the life of Jesus. Now I want you to grab a hold of this. Are you ready? In your Bible, you have four gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's 28 chapters in Matthew, 16 chapters in Mark, 24 chapters in Luke, and 21 chapters in John. Of all of those chapters of those four gospel records, at least one-third of each of these books deal with Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. A third of everything we know about Jesus in the Gospels is confined to those seven days. I think what God was telling us is that's a big deal to him. What Jesus did from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday is a big deal. And so for us, I want it to be a big deal, but I wanted you to have a deeper understanding of the light of Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday that the, that the light has cast a shadow in the Old Testament that they didn't necessarily understand, but there was a building up to it. And so this morning, I want you to understand that of all seven of these feasts, all seven of them had three major features. First of all, these seven feasts that Israel was to observe, number one, they were historical. There was some type of historical event that they were connected to, some type of historical command that God had given. And so it was to serve as a reminder. Number two, they were to be sacrificial. All seven feasts required sacrifice. There was going to be bloodshed. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It was to be a constant reminder to the people that their sin had cost a great price. Thirdly, and the one that you're going to be the most interested in, it was prophetical. All seven feasts have a prophetical nature in which they're pointing to something of the future. We understand very easily, probably today, that the Passover is directly connected to the cross. 
And so we understand that Jesus is the Passover lamb. Remember John, John 1, John said, behold the lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. John was talking, talking about Jesus being the lamb. There was a prescription in the Passover. The Passover lamb had to be a male, it had to be firstborn, and it had to be without blemish. All of those things were shadows pointing to the cross and the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus, who would be crucified. All of these shadows of the Old Testament were simply a long shadow cast by the light of the New Testament. Tonight, you're going to have the opportunity to hear from Ephraim Goldstein about how Messiah can be seen in the Passover. I can't encourage you enough to come back tonight because tonight you're going to have a deeper understanding of that. But this morning, what I want to do is move to the second feast then, and I want to talk to you about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, one that you may not be as familiar with as what we would call the Feast of Passover. So tonight you'll learn more about Passover, but I want to go to the second feast, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Notice what it says in verse 6. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now let's just be honest for a minute. If we're doing our quiet time and we've come to the book of Leviticus and we start reading about all of these feasts and these dates and these sacrifices, it can be a little mind-boggling. So can we stop for a moment this morning and just try to dissect it and to see, is there really a need for us to know anything about Leviticus 23? What is so significant? as a New Testament believer in 2023 in Richmond, Kentucky, to know something about an ancient book of Leviticus about a law that we have been freed from because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, what does that really have to do with us? Do we even need to read the book of Leviticus 23? Well, here's the simple answer. Yes. You need to read Leviticus 23 because there is direct connection to our faith it's there. It's the shadows of the light. Notice in verse 6, the very first word is the word then. It's a conjunction. It tells us it's connected to something that happened before it. What happened before it? Verse 5, in the first month on the 14th day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And so when we're looking at that, I wanted you to see the very first feast is Passover. The second feast is what we're talking about this morning, unleavened bread. What does that have to do with my New Testament faith? Well, let's talk about it. I want to give you two points this morning. Two points. That's not Baptist, is it? But it's two points. I have three subpoints under all of them, so really it's about eight points, all right? Just didn't want you to get your hopes up too much. Here it is. Number one is this, history. Number two is this his story. History and his story. That's how we're going to look at that. So here it is. Number one, unleavened bread and its history. In verse six, then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Well, let's just dig into it. All right. Number one, when we look at this, we have to realize we're reading a Middle Eastern Bible with a Western mind. We also have to understand that they did not reckon time the way that we do. We say that a morning and an evening make up a day. But for the Jews, it was an evening and then a morning. Remember this? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And the light he called day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning was the first day. You got that? That's how Jews even today reconcile time. When we lead tours to Israel, what I try to do is get it worked out so that we get to Jerusalem so that you're able to see the Jews praying at the Western Wall on Sabbath. Sabbath for them is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And when we get there on Saturday, the moment that Sabbath is over, 
They break their holy huddle, they back away from the wall, they turn, and they walk away. It's amazing to see how they still keep their Sabbath. So their days are reckoned differently, their months are reckoned differently. So I want you to notice the date that it talks about here. It says, then on the 15th day of the same month, there's the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. We know that in the verse before this, it says on the 14th day of the first month. All right, I'm living in Richmond, Kentucky. It's the year 2023. I open my Bible and I read Leviticus 23 and it says on the first month, the 14th day, and I'm saying in my mind that is January 14th. The problem is not only do they do their days differently, they do their months differently, and then they do their years differently. The first month of their religious year falls on our calendar somewhere between March and April. Here's the reason why. When you're looking at their calendar, all of these names on the outside of the ring, that's the name of Jewish months. On the inside of the ring, you're able to see the names of our months. They operate on a lunar calendar. We operate on a solar calendar. We may have 30 days in a month or 31 days in a month or even 28 days in a month. We have a leap year. Their months are based off the cycles of the moon. And so there's 28 days in each of their months. That's why for us, many times trying to correlate Easter and Passover, they're not correlating very often. Many times they're not. And so many times when they're celebrating Passover, we will have already celebrated Easter or we've already celebrated Easter and they're just now celebrating Passover because we're operating on two different calendars. And so what, what God did for them, and he said, we're going to start a brand new year. That year is going to be our religious calendar, and it's going to be a reminder to you that you're to observe this every year. Here's the example I want to give you. What day is Christmas on every year? Okay, that's the date. What day is it on? Could be Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Why? Because the date is fixed, but not the day. Now, for us, we have that Easter is going to be on a Sunday. It's always going to be on a Sunday. For them, Passover is always going to be, listen to it, Nisan 14. Nisan 14 is always going to be Passover. Always. Now, it may happen on a Monday, all the way around back to a Sunday or one of the days in between. But it's a fixed date, just like Christmas is for us. December 25th is always Christmas, regardless of the day of the week. For them, Nisan 14 is always Passover. But it could be any of the days of the week. So Nisan 14 is Passover. We're given the date Nisan 15 as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You say, Pastor, I'm not getting why this is important. Just stick with me. This is the history portion. The his story portion is going to make the connection. But notice Nisan 15. That's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And on this day, they were to get rid of all of the leaven that was in their house. Notice what it says in the detail of verse 6. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall not do any laborious work. But for seven days, you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. How can we dissect that? Well, let's make sure we understand the historical connections. Passover was a result of the 10th plague over Egypt. Do you remember this in the book of Exodus? God's people are in bondage by Pharaoh down in Egypt, and they cry out in anger and in pain and in suffering, and God raises up a deliverer by the name of Moses. Moses goes, and as Moses goes to deliver them, there's 10 plagues that God puts on Egypt. Those 10 plagues are actually God waging war with the gods of Egypt. Each of those 10 plagues are representing a God in Egypt. For example, there was the plague of frogs. And they looked at the frog in Egypt and they said, how amazing is this? It starts off in the water, it's a tadpole, and then it grows legs and then the tail goes away. And then it becomes a land creature and it's a, it's a frog. This is miraculous, we need to worship this. 
So they had a god by the name of Hepta. Hepta was the frog god. So they worshiped the frog god who brought the frogs. God said, no, it's not Hepta that brings the frogs. I am the creator of the frog. And in fact, I have all control over the frogs. And so if you remember this in the book of Exodus, it's almost comical that all of a sudden, all of these frogs start coming out of the Nile and they start filtrating all throughout Egypt. And there's frogs literally everywhere. You go to the, to the Chester drawer to get a pair of socks, there's frogs in the drawer. You reach in really quick and grab a pair of socks. They're heavier than normal. You look, there's frogs in your socks. You think, forget the socks, I'm just gonna wear shoes. You go to get the shoes and guess what? Frogs are in your shoes. You say, forget it, I'll go barefoot. You go downstairs, you say, I'm ready to have breakfast. You open the oven, you're gonna put some biscuits in there. Do I have any biscuit fans? We're gonna talk about biscuits in just a minute. I, I got hungry thinking about that. Um, there were frogs in the oven. You said, forget the biscuits, I'll just have oatmeal. You go to set the pot on the, on the stovetop to fix breakfast and look, there's frogs in the pot. There's frogs everywhere. And God said, look, I'm the one who has control over the frogs. And they say, just get rid of the frogs. This happens with all 10 plagues. At the 10th plague, it was the plague of the death of the firstborn. And the death of the firstborn, if you were to be excluded from that, what would happen is you would take the lamb, a male, without blemish of the first year, you would sacrifice it. You would put the blood on the doorposts and the lentils. That was to say, I have had faith in what God's told me to do. The death angel would pass over. That's how Passover is connected historically. But in history, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the next thing. And that is that they were to cast all the leaven out of their house. They were not going to have time to take and make loaves of bread. And so what they did is they took unleavened bread. It was called the bread of haste. This is what unleavened bread looks like. It is bread without leaven. And so today, even in the Jewish culture, when they began to prepare for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they get all of the leaven out of their house. And they've even kind of made a little bit of a game of it where the father goes around even with a feather, looking through the house, making sure every speck of leaven is gone out of the house. Have you ever had true unleavened bread? It is uh, interesting. Uh, I remember when Jess and I had just gotten married. And uh, I, think I, I think I was the one to pick up the groceries. I can't remember. It might have been someone else, but I might have been the one to pick up the groceries and could have been someone else, but it might have been me. <laughs> and you know, I'm a man. I don't know all this stuff, but I, I picked up flour. It all looks like flour. It all said flour on it. I didn't realize that there's a big difference when it says all purpose and self-rising. Self-rising, it sounded, you know, kind of puffed up to me, so I didn't want to get it. So I got the all purpose. I took it home. And Jess, you know, we knew why she was she's gonna make some biscuits. Now let's talk about biscuits, right? And and so she she made the biscuits out of this all-purpose flour and she put them in the oven and they came out. And listen, every biscuit weighed about 10 pounds. <laughs> and they were as hard as a rock and they looked like a hockey puck, and I'm pretty sure that might have been the stone David used to throw at Goliath. I mean, it was hard. It was hard. And uh, I learned real quick there's a difference when there's leaven in the bread and there's not. They were to get rid of all of the leaven. Historically, that's what they were supposed to do. Remember, though, there's a shadow involved here. There's a light in the New Testament that we got to connect this to. What is significant about the fact that there was unleavened bread. Well, the word unleavened in the original language, we get what we call today, you probably heard of this, matzah, matzah bread. That's literally what the word unleavened means. And, and the word matzah literally means tasteless bread. It's tasteless bread. And so even though they're far removed, in fact, they did this for 1,500 years where every year, and there's still Jews that do this today, they would remove all of the leaven out of their house. Why? It was connecting them to their history. When God thrust them out of Egypt in haste. But is there a light that is connected there? That's the second thing I wanted you to see. Unleavened bread and his story. 
Look, if you will, at verse 6. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there is the feast of unleavened bread. It is the unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Well, let's talk about the shadow of leaven in the Old Testament and the light of leaven in the New Testament. I want to give you some verses just to put in your mind. Are you ready? Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together, that they were stepping on one another, Jesus began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Mark chapter 8 and verse 15, and he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Can you see the symbolism that Jesus is pointing to? As you're reading that, hopefully you're seeing that, that Jesus is giving a caution about leaven. He's using leaven symbolically. He's talking about wickedness. He's talking about evil. He's talking about hatred. And then Paul makes it incredibly clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the lump? They understood that. That when you take unleavened bread or dough and you put the leaven in it, it'll cause it to be puffed up. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. Just as you are, in fact, unleavened, listen, you as believers in the New Testament have a connection to the Old Testament feast of unleavened bread. How is that possible? He says, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ is our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and of wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In other words, leaven is symbolic of sin. And he says, as believers, we're to cast sin out. So in the same way that they were getting the leaven out of their house every year, the father taking that feather and scooping every last speck of leaven out of the house, being meticulous to make sure all the leaven was out of their house. What the New Testament tells us is that the reason why they were doing that all that time in the Old Testament was because the light of the New Testament showed us that leaven was symbolic of sin and that we needed to have sin purged from our life. How was that possible? Through Jesus, our Passover. How is that possible? Here's the date again, Leviticus 23, verse 6. Then on the 15th day of the same month, on the particular year that Jesus was crucified, the Bible teaches us that it would have been on Nisan 14 just like every other year. And Nisan 14 just so happened to fall on a Friday. And this is the day that the Passover would happen. The Passover lambs were, were slaughtered at 3 p.m. That is the exact time that Jesus died on the cross. The Bible tells us that at 3 p.m., Jesus gave up the ghost. He died on the cross. So we're connected to Passover through the cross. So what is the significance of unleavened bread to us as believers? Are you ready for this? Jesus is the Lamb of God without sin. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And as the bread of life, Jesus is sinless. He is the unleavened bread. Why is it that in Passover, and now what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper, that we take the unleavened bread and break it? It is because the unleavened bread is symbolic of the body of Christ, which will be broken for the sins of many. How and why can it be broken? Because it's without leaven. What does that mean? It means that Jesus was sinless. That's the only reason why he could be our sacrifice. If he was leavened, if he had sin in his own body, he'd have to die for his own sin. But because Jesus is the unleavened bread of life, he was able to die for the sin of the world. And so when you see unleavened bread, it looks like a body laid flat in the tomb. And there on Nisan 15, 
Jesus was buried in the tomb. Let me give you a verse. Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man of of Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. Notice the very first phrase, when it was evening. Do you remember how Jews reckon days? The evening and the morning is the next day. On Nisan 14, Jesus, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for your sin and my sin. On Nisan 15, he's buried in the tomb. And there being buried in the tomb, he has taken sin and carried it far away from us. He who is unleavened bread, he became sin who knew no sin. He has carried it far away from us. The whole light of the New Testament, that leaven was symbolic of sin, that Christ was without sin, and all that they were doing in all of these feasts for 1,500 years, everything that they were doing and removing the leaven from their house was to teach you and me today that we have to have sin purged from our life. How do we do that? through the Passover lamb who died on Calvary's cross, who on uh, Nisan 15 was buried in a borrowed tomb. And that detail is the perfect detail of what happened from Exodus 12, 39. They baked the dough which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not become leaven since they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Historically, they were doing it as a reminder of what God had done for them in the past. Sacrificially, there was going to be bloodshed involved in every one of these feasts, but prophetically what it was pointing to is Jesus. Passover points to the death. Unleavened bread points to the burial. And guess what points to the resurrection? First fruits, the very next feast that we're going to study. Next Sunday when we come together for Resurrection Sunday, when we come to celebrate Easter, we're going to talk about the Feast of First Fruits. And there is a grand celebration that happens. And the dating and the detail and the purpose all are coinciding with the person of Jesus Christ. It's shadows in the Old Testament that's been cast by the light of the New Testament. And so today I want you to be able to have the opportunity to step out of the shadows and into the light. I want you to know that the whole purpose of why these feasts were celebrated was to get us to this place of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And I wanna tell you, when you can understand that you take the bread and the cup in your hand when we have Lord's Supper tonight, and that that bread is unleavened because there's no sin in Christ, and because he can remove the sin out of your life. And you take that cup and you drink the the juice that's there and you understand it's symbolic of the blood and you realize the sacrifice that was made, then all of a sudden this really becomes very, very meaningful. So this morning, if you need to step out of the darkness and into the light, I wanna invite you to come to Jesus. Come celebrate the real purpose behind unleavened bread, that our sinless sacrifice has removed sin from us, and that that can be found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm gonna ask you to stand. How is the Lord convicting you today? Is he saying, hey, this is the time, this is the moment that I need to step out in faith and understanding the death, burial, and resurrection, that I need that in my life? Is it this morning that the Lord's going to begin to convict you and say, hey, you have lost friends and family members that you you need to start reaching for Christ. Maybe you just have a prayer request you want to come to the altar and pray for. Maybe it's to come and join in membership. But whatever it is, I want to ask you to be obedient this morning to whatever it is the Lord calls you to do. Father, as only you can, take this text of Scripture, inscribe it upon our hearts, let it become clarity for us. God, help us to understand its connection to our New Testament faith and how it is that your death, burial, and resurrection can remove the sin, the leaven of our life. And Father, we will trust you in this moment in Jesus' name.
Amen. Mr. Jason may have some news for us. We're going to give them just a minute. Um, I'm just going to take a second here and um, remind you that this next week, we have some exciting things going on. Of course, Easter Sunday next Sunday, but also Saturday. Um, if you have kids, 
or you have neighbors who have kids, we will have our Easter extravaganza um, on Saturday at 1030 next week. So um, we look forward to being able to celebrate um, that day with, of course, a glow-in-the-dark egg hunt and some other fun things where we get to walk through the Easter story together as families. So um, it's been a good day to be in the house of the Lord, as always. All right. And then I'm going to go ahead and tell you that Jason is going to close us in, in prayer this morning. All right, I have some great news. This is Tina Sizemore and Amber Gonzalez. Uh, they came forward today to let you know that uh, they have heard the call of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, and they have given their hearts in salvation. They will be baptized next Sunday. All right. If you will, let's go ahead and bow with our closing prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much today for the restoration of the Amber and Tina's hearts. Lord, we just know that um, there is no one that is outside of your calling. There is no one that you will not go to the ends of the earth to find, to be able to leave the 99 and to go seek that one. And Father, we just thank you so much for your triumphal entry um, on that Palm Sunday, Lord, that you are the victorious uh, God in our lives, that you are the Savior of our souls. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we get constant reminders of how we are able to celebrate the prophetic word in your Bible and the way that we can be able to see that uh, be brought out into history. Father, you are truth. You are our life and you are our Savior. And Father, we just thank you, Lord, today for all of those that are in need of a Savior that may hear this message and be able to come to the saving grace just as Tina and Amber have done today. And Father, we just ask you, Lord, as we go from this place, let us be able to be mindful of those that, that might need an invitation uh, next Sunday to come to Easter service, Father. Those members of our family that may be lost, neighbors that we know that are in the need of uh, a, a loving and a uh, God that is going to be with them and walk with them in whatever troubles they have. And Father, as we leave this place, let us always be joyful the fact that we have a Savior in your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And all the 